this mixtape tonight. Rewind. Back in time. Life perspective in the light. Sit back, relax, it's mixtape tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, it's your host Mike Mixtape. This is Mixtape tonight, and tonight, uh, this is the second one we're doing. And I figured, why not do an interview with my, I should say, lifelong best British buddy, Steph Felton. Hi. Um, if you call lifelong three years, then what have I done? <laughs> You get less for murder sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. It's just the, the our chemistry just seems to be, you know, fun and wacky and fun. True, very true. So and um, about about ninety nine point nine percent of it is you teasing me, and then you get the cute reaction out of me, and then you just sit there giggling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know me too much, and I know you too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how our friendship is, uh, in a nutshell. But yeah, uh, people got people got to uh, witness that in our in my vlogmas of day two last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm yes. a child. <laughs> you know. Oh, I can I, I can I can still bring that out for the viewers to see. You can't see it though, because I'm doing this a different way of recording as usual. But for the viewers at home, of course. But the viewers at home can see this fake glorious laser gun. And, uh, yeah, I went, like, I'll, I'll put a link to that video below, if you want to see, or the card right next to me, and it's just basically me going, I am a child! <laughs> just like that. It's pretty fun. It's actually With one of my... as well. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good vlog, actually. I mean, you should... De this is why I'm highlighting Steph Fellow, because she's got a great channel, and she's trying to put more content up, and we're going to here to explore her life. A bit her uh, taste in music, movies, maybe some television. Who knows? We'll see what we discover here. Yeah. Um, I kind of, like I said to Mike before we got recording, I said this feels very much like at the end of it, he's just going to hand me a book and be like, Steph Felton, this is your life. <laughs> so yeah, um, like I said, we're just going to go from the youth to adolescent all the way up to present day. And take it one step at a time. And the first question that I always ask my guests is, what is the earliest memory? Hold on, sorry. What is your earliest memory when it comes to music? Um, it's really kind of hard to think. Like, I think in a way, like, we've always had music around us, like, and that sort of thing. And definitely, like, memories of like listening to disney songs on cassette tape yes i am that old people cassette tape uh in the car and things like that and singing along to that and you know even just listening to the songs in the films and stuff like that when back you're a kid back when you're a kid it's like why are these songs here okay the songs are just here and you don't think much of it but then as an adult that's like the bit you always look forward to <laughs> in disney <laughs> films is just hearing the songs but i just remember like like another memory I kind of have is like going into my sister's bedroom and she had like this um like this kind of I guess you could kind of call it like this sort of cassette player like blasting loud music and the loud music happened to be the Spice Girls and that kind of that kind of thing so um you know I think that's like my most earliest memories in some way but definitely you know I remember having a lot of car trips where you know we listened to you know we'd like listen to some of the 2000s music and things like that but also like listening to some of my mum and dad's music like from the 70s and 80s and that kind of thing you know and you know and also like in school like I remember certain teachers may you know they would play music like as you were kind of coming into the assembly hall and things like that and I remember a couple of times like um the Beatles playing like I remember just sometimes sitting there listening to Love Me Do or um you know Help and things like that so basically um 
I guess when I look at it, I've had like a very extensive um, range of music to kind of listen to in a way. So I've been able to like listen to the stuff that I grew up with, but also I've got that kind of, I guess you can kind of call it extensive knowledge of older music and things like that. And, you know, I do have that appreciation for older music, you know, because often people do say the music, like, you always say that your generation was the best. And it's not just music, but like television, films, um, well, you know, things like that. You always say that your generation was the best. And then the next, and then like, the generations before you were like legendary and then the generations after you you're just like what the fuck is this rubbish but you know sometimes you have a bit of an appreciation for it but you can appreciate the fact it's theirs and you know even though you do have that scary thought that like in possibly 10 years time you're gonna have people saying like on facebook hey if if you remember these people then your childhood was awesome and it'd be the people from twilight but that's just that sort of thing so for me I kind of like the fact that I've got an extensive knowledge of music and things like that because it kind of just shows that like I'm not just your typical young person I do have this extensive knowledge like I know who the Beatles are I know who you know I know various versions of a song called The Power of Love or a song called Hero and things like that and there are songs that I do enjoy when I hear them. I think, oh, brilliant. I haven't heard this in ages or, oh, I love this one. You know, it's that kind of thing, especially for um, listening to Leisure FM, which is a local radio station in Braintree, where they play some really obscure things from the 2000s. And you think, oh, my God, I haven't heard this since I was like eight or nine years old, you know, and that sort of thing. And, of course, you know, the whole thing of like, being in the playground and singing songs like Round Round by the Sugar Babes, singing that with your friends in the playground, uh, being totally oblivious about what the song actually means until years later when you realise it's about having a one-night stand. You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of like um, going off on a massive tangent, but I kind of would say those are like my memories of like music and whatever when I was like younger. And one thing for television is that I do remember I was on television once. If anybody in the UK uh, remembers a show on CBBC called Exchange and you saw uh, a stupid little twit with, little, with her hair tied back in a ponytail with two little braids right in front of her face, that was me. That was me. I was I was a little twit. I was that little twit who had the hair tie had, had the hair tie back in a ponytail and two braids in front of my face. Well, you know, you were going to be on the telly. You want to have nice hair or stuff. But I remember having two little beads on the end. But before I went out, like I said to mum, "Oh, can you take the beads out? I feel like they're going to be too much." Or I'm not quite sure about the beads. Maybe too much or something like that. Which, as if having just two braids dangling in front of your face isn't too much already. You know. Hmm. Ah, so I was just gonna ask to lead up to this. Uh, are you more of a music person rather than for television and movies, or vice versa? I think I think in a way when it comes to it, I'm definitely more music and television in a way, and I guess maybe a little bit of theater, like not like theatre as in movie theatre in America but as in theatre as in on the stage you know I mean there are movies out there that I've seen and I've really enjoyed and things like that but I just feel like sometimes my extension my attention span isn't that massive anymore so if I if if I'm going to watch a film it has to be something that I really want to watch and I'm going to you know and something to gear me up you know to gear myself up for watching it and that sort of thing you know Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, going through schooling, you went through a normal school life leading up to... So, in school, did you have a pursuit in music in any ways? Like music class, like singing, or playing I any instruments? Um, in my early years, I don't really kind of remember much about like having the whole... Um, singing lessons or things like that like I mean probably up until about year nine I used to take part in the annual 
Edith Borfoot School Christmas show and like we very rarely did singing and stuff most classes would just like do a dance or something to a track on a CD or something like that um, and I, I think I remember one year I think I, I might have been in year I think I was in year four possibly it might have been year four year five where we did something from Alice in Wonderland and I got to be the Queen of Hearts and that sort of thing and we did this song about having things at a tea party and so we sung that with a piano but then forwarding to um, year nine which basically was going to be the last year I would do it because originally the school Christmas show was the whole school so it was the school phase which was early years up to year nine along with transition which was year 10 year 11 and then extra years of like year 12 year 13 and year 14 but then by the time I got to I think it might might be when I was in year eight they announced that it was or actually it might be when I was in year nine that they announced that the last um actually it might have been the year before when I was in year eight it was the last year that they were going to have um transition involved because basically it was like because you got so many classes in the school phase alone to feature transition as well was just the show would have gone on forever and that kind of thing you know but basically my last christmas show that we did was in year nine and we did our own version of the 12 days of christmas and we um, each in the class had a go rewriting them and we had different ones and i remember me and my two friends were um my me and my two friends Soph and Joanne we were eight nine and ten I was ten Joanne was nine and Sophie was eight and she was eight Christmas presents I think Joanne was no nine snowmen dancing and mine was ten bells are ringing you know that kind of thing and um and I do remember, remember I think it was because originally we used to do two days or two days for the parents. Um, there are two shows for the parents. And then we did a third one in the morning for the whole school to see because often it'd be a case where you come on stage, you do your bit and then you go back to your class or depending whereabouts you were in the lineup. Like, for instance, in year nine, you'd be the last act. So you go on, you go back into the DT room. And then you'd all, like everyone would gather and then you would go back on to do the finale, that kind of thing. Um, so, and I remember it was the day we were going to do it for the school that my poor friend Soph, her voice went funny and she couldn't speak very well, so let alone not able to sing. So luckily we chatted with the, um, you know, with some of the teachers. And luckily uh, the teaching assistant, we had Tina, who's a very good uh, family friend of ours, she stepped in for Soph and then someone else who was playing the person who receives the gifts was off ill that day so luckily my friend Sophie got to stand in for the person who receives the presents Tina got to do her singing bit to help her out and everything was fine and um, I remember doing a lot of things like in year seven we did Dr. Doolittle's song of um, walk with uh, sorry talk to the animals and I remember we were all sort of like um talking about like what animal we'd like to be and whatever and one of my friends said oh I'd like to play Dr. Doolittle you know I bet I'm going to be picked to do Dr. Doolittle and I thought oh I might like and then there was me like oh I'd probably like to be a dolphin but then I got picked to be Dr. Doolittle and I don't know if we still got it in the house somewhere but my I think one of the teachers took a picture of me standing like that with my little sort of you know my shirt on my blazer jacket my little ruffled um, scarf and a top hat as well and I just basically had my hair put in a high ponytail so I could just flip my hair forward and stick it into the hat so that was pretty cool and that was pretty good fun to do and then I think with transition I remember I was in a school I was in a school band and we I joined the school band and I remember we did one one thing our band got involved with was with the drama group summer production of Sergeant Pepper's Take Two, which was basically their own kind of like little, kind of little stage production of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, mm-hmm. where they'd have these dances and things like that, put to 
the album of Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. But the only one that wasn't on that the only song on that album we didn't use was With a Little Help from My Friends, because that was what our school band did. And luckily, uh, we had three performances. We had one to the school and two for the parents. And what happened was is that we were covered up by these kind of panel things on wheels. And then they moved them away. Actually, they, like, moved them away. So we get revealed, you know, with the line, let me introduce you, the one and only Billy Shears, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and then we get revealed and we, we do the song. Mm-hmm. So what was happened, supposed to happen, and thank God this happened for the day when we performed to the school, because if it was, like, the parents or anything, I probably would have massively died of embarrassment. <clears throat> so what happened was is that we had these panels and they were supposed to go from right to left but what happened was is they went from left to right and my microphone stand got stuck into there so i'm playing my bass guitar singing into this like you know singing into this board and while there was a spare mic i'm trying to pull it out but it's stuck and then at one point it they pulled the thing away the microphone fell over so i'm having to pick it up try and put the legs down so i forgot about playing the bass guitar so i'm trying to get in there and i missed that section of the song because i was too busy fighting with this bloody microphone stand and boy did i get (laughs) boy did i (laughs) did i get teased by my band (laughs) about missing part the song and shortening it because it's like well i was i was like what was i supposed to do fucking microphones now, <laughs> fucking panels da, 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 da. you know that sort of thing but but that was pretty cool and but apart from that um the rest of the time it went very well and i was so, and after a while i had like this tiny bit of claustrophobia about that big between the panel and my microphone stand and maybe i, I might have done this thing where i just held on to it so that when they moved the panels out of the way, the microphone was not going to go with it. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, and then actually it was uh, at some point in year 11 that I quit the school band to go over to the drama group because basically this was on a Wednesday afternoon where we had options. So you go and do something, you go and join one of the classes. So like the school band, drama, I think there might have been art and other things as well, or singing. And I think at one point, uh, might have been in, um, might have been in year le- uh, year ten, that there was a singing class, and I joined that for a little while. And it's kind of hard to sort of think about because it was like over ten years ago. Uh-huh. Scary, but true. Uh-huh. And um, so yeah, and I got to be part of the school choir when we had uh, a carol service at St Mary's Church. And I think I did that, yeah, I did that two years in a row, but I didn't do it in my my last year at school. And Mrs. Rowe was a a little bit miffed that, you know, someone of my talent was not going to be in the school choir that year. But also the fact that rehearsals were on a Friday and I was doing something else on a Friday, um, that kind of thing. So that's kind of basically a lot of things. Like um, really how I discovered that uh, my own kind of, unique singing voice and what was only in year 10 when we had a substitute teacher and we had the singing class but it was kind of like we do like band songs or whatever and where I learnt about the Junior Lennon song Saltwater which is a pretty good song actually highly recommend it and that sort of thing so definitely with schooling like I wouldn't I would say that the singing portion and whatever or kind of more musical side when actually doing that independently came more like from year nine onwards. Mm. Okay. okay. I do apologise if this interview is going to be like two hours long or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that actually leads into my next question. Uh, there's actually oh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a couple back to back here. First thing is what music what musician or song in particular got you like into music like you wanted to you sang it or you like like listen to it over and over like um i think the only thing that comes to mind when you say that is when i was 15 years old and i was obsessed with the beatles (laughs) you know i i had i had the red album and the blue album but i didn't get any of their other albums until I was like 
actually I might have been depending actually I think I remember buying some of those when I was 16 because I've been to the Beatles Museum twice once when I was 15 um, during the October half term holiday because we were going to Blackpool for our holiday for mm-hmm. a couple of days and, and and that trip to Blackpool I will never forget the fact that my feet were so sore and I felt like they were swollen underneath because of all the walking we did but that probably just meant I, it was probably just saying to me that like I was just a, such an unfit um, activities wise uh, 15 year old you know but going to the Beatles Museum and I remember just like being able to like listen to all the Beatles songs and pretty much remembering all the lyrics and things like that and also i remember like when i was in the school band like we did learn some beatles songs or whatever like come by can't buy me love which i've recently added to my repertoire because you know and i did that <coughs> i did that at jardines last month and i thought i'll give it a go see how it goes and i felt really great about it and and just brought back all the wonderful memories of doing it because not only did i play the bass guitar in that song but I actually got to sing it so I had like my own little solo but like definitely things like the Beatles um I just remember like listening to them on CDs and stuff like that and actually it was through Beatles songs that I learned how to do karaoke because of having you know listened to the song you know 15,000 times some songs that were online on YouTube for karaoke purposes, I was able to do because I knew the, not only did I know the words, but I knew the timings and things like that and whatever. So, you know, it was that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if it's because I knew that like Paul McCartney played the bass guitar like I did and he was left-handed like I am, that kind of thing. But I, I don't know what it is, but I think just something with me just stuck with the Beatles and of course I, I pretty much had a crush on basically on Paul, George and Ringo but John Lennon just never did anything for me but you know but I can I can appreciate his music and things like that you know and I remember also when going to the Beatles museums actually it might have been I got albums of the Beatles and whatever for my birthday or I might have bought a couple of them from from Sainsbury's, I think, because it was around about the time like the Beatles were celebrating some special anniversary or whatever. But you know, I I had a couple of the albums, and also I I've had albums of uh, Paul McCartney's, which was All the Best, which was his greatest hits, and then I had George Harrison's one, which had recently come out that year, which was Let It Roll, which was his greatest hit. So I got to hear some of his solo career and. I have to say, when it comes to it, like, I think both Ringo and George were the underrated ones, because, like, because, I mean, Ringo did some pretty cool songs and whatever, and I've got two on his, on my phone, which are from his 2008 album, which are Why Not and Walk With You, that he did with Paul McCartney, and George Harrison's stuff is brilliant, not just all those years ago, but What Is Life, uh, My Sweet Lord... Um, and oh back when we was fab you know that kind of thing there was lots of interesting songs and I mean Ringo Starr did some really interesting songs as well so definitely you could tell that like Lennon and McCartney were like the the front men you know even though it was all of them in, in it all together but you know those two were definitely the most remembered and like Star and Harrison were very much the underrated ones so you know so I I mean I mean over the years just like you know just finding like different songs to listen to and like I think we've all been through that phase where you know we all really like a song so we download it on our phone and then we listen to it over and over again until we're sick of it you know that kind of thing but like especially with um you know, having things like iTunes or whatever on my phone, I was able to like have like music from my early 2000s and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 
and just having CDs. Yes, this shows how old I am, CDs and stuff like that. By the way, for the youngsters who were thinking, oh, apparently you could throw them against the wall and smear honey on them, that was bollocks. Even I knew that. Like, I didn't realise about... I didn't learn that that was a myth until I saw uh, the 100 Greatest Gadgets with Steam Fry that they had this thing saying like, oh, these CDs, you can throw them against the wall, you can scratch the hell out of them, you can smear peanut butter, honey, jam, whatever you want it, clear it off, and it will still play. That was utter bollocks, because we always knew that you had to put your finger in the hole, right, hey? had to put your finger in the hole and and put your hand in a weird position just to handle it, because as soon as you put a fingerprint on it, that was it. That was that was bye bye CD. CD's gone forever. You know, or CD will never work properly again. You know, so um, so yeah. So I mean, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. Like I, I'd said about the Beatles, but it's really hard to kind of pinpoint for me certain artists and people like songs when growing up because right. there were so many for like so many for different reasons yeah. why I like them, you know? Which ones kind of inspire your sound, in a way? Definitely my sound. Uh, when I was kind of like... I, it's hard to kind of really pinpoint my journey bit by bit with my singing. But definitely, like, I think because when I was growing up and doing things you know things like the school band and stuff we did do the older songs so we did things like too much monkey business roll over beethoven johnny be good Beatles songs you know things like that right um you know like we we very rarely did like modern songs i think we did try and learn love story by taylor swift but i found that was quite quite tough on my vocals and I it probably still it might be a bit tough on my vocals now but it was pretty tough on my 15 year old vo- vocals and stuff like that uh, you know um, but also we did things like um, down in the tube down in the tube station at midnight by the jam oh my god like <laughs> like the ba- the bass the bass line for that was really hard and I, I even had the most improvised version because usually it was for um, for the guitar it was just like this chord, this chord this chord this chord, but bass guitar was bam, 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 bam that was the simplified version, simplified version, but the normal version was bum, 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 bada, bum, bada, 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 and then bing, 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 and then ding, 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 it's like, it's just, it's just, like, everybody's like going at normal speed for the song, and I'm just like, and my hands just like, <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, this is so hard, Mr. White, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, because my um, my science teacher was also the person who was in the who you know led the school band that kind of thing and taught me guitar and things like that. So yeah, my science teacher was my guitar teacher as well. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> so so yeah. So um, for what and so I think that probably might have been meditated into me from an early age, the fact that you know and, and maybe like when doing things or whatever or like finding youtube videos or karaoke um songs or whatever and finding like a song that a modern song that i think oh i really like that i like singing along to it i think i'm pretty okay but then once you get the karaoke version you're just like "Uh." (laughs) Mm -hmm. because what i find is with like modern songs it's not so much the key and stuff but you've got the key the tempo, timing, and the whole wobbly, wobbly, waffly bollocks that normal people call vocalising and that kind of thing. That I'm just like, really? Can't, can't we just sing the song? You're just... People who like add vocalising into their songs or whatever, number one, you're just making the song impossible for people to sing along to and replicate. Two, you're just showing off. Number three, shut up. Number four, Sing the fucking song, and number five, shut up. 
Yeah, Sharp was so important, it, it popped up twice. <laughs> you know. So we'll kind of drift away from music for a little bit um, because I know for a fact that you got into theater. So when did that portion of your life go into theater? I think the big pinpoint for me was um, when I was about about 15 years old that I made the swap from the school band. I left the school band and I went into the drama group and that kind of thing. And then we, yeah, and we basically would do things like we would um, play drama games and that kind of thing. And actually it was through my drama teacher, Andrew Colley, um, I was actually able to do a qualification in drama, which had no real kind of like valid qualification like qualities to help you get into say college things like that you know because most of the qualifications I got from school were just like something that you weren't really able to kind of use to get into college and things like that because like you know you needed GCSEs and things like that I think the closest thing I got to which was the equivalent of GCS, some sort of GCSE, which was my functional skills, math, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, and very much, basically the best way to uh, describe the qualifications I've got from school is that imagine you're working somewhere and they pay you in dollars, you know, they pay you in dollars, but you want to go to, but, but you want to go to England and pay for stuff or you need money to get into England, but you haven't got the right currency to get into England, you know, that kind of thing, you know, or it's like having dollar, like, it's like going into a sweet shop, say in England, and you want to pay for something that's in pounds and pence, and you've only got dollars and cents. It's a bit redundant and that kind of thing. But, you know, but I think in a way, you know, I think it was around about that time I was figuring out what I kind of wanted to do because at first I didn't want to go to college I wanted to just leave, leave school when I was 16 and get a job somewhere and stuff like that but then uh, that was when I was 13 but then you know actually it might have been when I was 15 and stuff because I, I wasn't sure about having the extra year at school and that kind of thing <laughs> but um but then luckily we managed to find a way around it and things like that and then basically um I did performing arts. Yes, yeah, so I did drama at school. Um, like that was when we got into like the proper. I guess you can kind of say proper drama, because also, I, like I said, I did uh, some sort of qualification in drama, and we and we did school plays, and we had and the first one I took part with in was the Bo the Borthwick Narnia. There's a bit of a theme with this. Hold on, uh, mm -hmm. where basically we did our own version of. The Chronicles of Narnia and the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So, and I got to play the Wicked Queen and I got to play a little bit of my guitar and that sort of thing. And then I like disappear off, change to be the Queen and come back, that kind of thing. And then the following year, in my last year at school, we did the Borthwick Tempest, which was our own version of the Tempest. Like, we didn't have, like, I think we had a couple of lines that people would use from the original play. And that sort of thing, and especially a line that my sister gave me, which I, I did use, where like, I played Trinculo, my friend, um, Film Buffo 6. Yes, I know Film Buffo 6. We went to school together. In fact, in my last year at school, we were in the same class, and he did drama with me. And basically, he played Stefano. So I was Trinculo, and um, Trinculo has this fantastic line of, Oh, Stefano, I've been such a pickle since I last saw you. <laughs> So, yeah, I got to do that. That was pretty cool. And, um, you know, and, and actually with us, like, we added an extra bit because often the play starts with the storm itself. So we had, like, uh, Prospero being a failed musician and that kind of thing, you know, and being kicked out and whatever, and then having his little baby daughter um, and then being put on a boat out to, um, you know, out to sea and to this island and that sort of thing because often it's, it's mentioned in the play but I don't think you actually see it and we actually portrayed that and um, <clears throat> you know 
we sort of did that and um, it was a really good play actually it was a pretty cool play and that sort of thing and we had some interesting ways of doing things like Caliban the monster we actually had two people play him so he had like two heads and the English itself or the dialogue like we didn't like we said we had a couple of lines from Shakespeare's Tempest but mostly it was improvised speech you know that kind of thing or whatever um <clears throat> You know, and uh, you know, so that's what we did. And then I remember it was not the year I left school, but the year afterwards, after doing, I think it was after I'd done a year of performing arts, I went back to go and see the school play and whatever. And they were doing the Borthwick Alice. I was, I can't remember what they did the year after. You know, the year after I left school or whatever. Um, that sort of thing, because I don't think I went to see the school play in 2011, but I think I saw it in 2012 because I just finished the level, level two uh, qualification in college. So then after that, um, I, another thing I did do in my last year at school was that I joined something called Theatre Resources, which is now called Zinc Arts, and it was a drama course. Well, I guess you can kind of call it an art course in general because I remember we did we did a film in the first term, a play in the second term, and we had an art exhibition in the third term. And basically, it was for adults with I think medium to moderate learning disabilities and that kind of thing. And that was where I met um, I met some great friends there, including a boyfriend I had and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and so basically I got to go there and it was really cool. And um, I was only able to do it for a year because we thought, oh, maybe I might be able to do it while still doing my college work and stuff. But it turned out on the course that I was going to do, I was still doing Fridays or I would have done Fridays, but then I had to go on a different course because that course got cancelled. So I had to go on a different course and it turns out I, I could have done the Fridays or whatever or something like that. I can't remember because I had to do a year of IT level one to get onto the level two performing arts course. So then after that, I got onto the level two performing arts course. But um, in a weird way, I've thought about this before. Like if I were to do an interview like this, it's, like, it's amazing how like James and Morgan did um, film arts in college Matt did fine arts and I did performing arts so between us four we've uh, pretty much got the arts covered you know <laughs> so um, <clears throat> around about that time it was um, it might have been 2000 well I went to a production in 2010 it was about November I went to this production where they did three um, one act plays and it was done by this group called the Bocking Theatre Club and I thought about joining them because the fact that I wasn't able to do performing arts at college in that year I was doing IT but I wanted to do something so they let me join and I was first active with them in 2011 which was eight years ago which believe it like uh-huh. I say, you get, you get, well I tell you what, you get less for murder um, <laughs> that sort of thing but like um but basically, I did props with my mum, that kind of thing. We, we looked after the props and, you know, gathered up props and we helped with props during the production, that kind of thing. And then my first performing role and whatever was in a variety show that we did uh, to help raise money for the panto that we were doing that year, the following year. And the first panto I did was Robinson Crusoe when I was... 18 years old this was the february of 2012 so i was still 18 and then the rest is history so then Mm -hmm. forwarding forwarding to september of 2011 uh, i was 18 most 18 year olds at that time would have you know done their college and whatever and gone on to university but like i said i had an extra year at school so I left instead of the day before my 16th birthday, I, I left the day before my 17th birthday. Um, I think I said, yeah, a day before my 16th birthday, but instead I left the day before my 17th birthday. So basically, I instead of being part of the leavers of 2009, like every other kid in 93, I was part of the leavers of 2010. So then um, I got to do, so forwarding to September 2011, 18 years old, um, I got to do performing arts and I did a year of 
the Level 2 BTEC Diploma in Performing Arts performance, which was really good. And luckily, I was able to make it on to the third year. Oh, sorry, the Level 3 extended. And I think I remember, actually, there was a bit of a, an issue when it came to doing my second year, because I thought, was I going to have to pay to do the two years at some point? Because it, like, by the time I was started the second year of the level three qualification i turned 20 and or it might have been after 19 that there would have been a problem but luckily there was a a legislation that if you hadn't you know if it was if you were under 24 and you hadn't got a level three qualification already you could you could do it for free so luckily i got to do that for free and i remember like in college we did quite a few interesting productions like um the main production and this was actually when they broke tradition because basically the main production used to be level two the level two course the level three first years and level three second years but there was loads of people on the level three course and the play they were going to do was much to do about nothing by shakespeare but unfortunately there wasn't enough roles to go around that kind of thing so we ended up doing a little play called our day out by willie rushton not willie rushton willie russell that was it and um and that was a pretty cool play because some of us got to put on welsh accents as well as everybody else putting on uh liverpoolian accents that kind of thing and um every time i think of the word liverpool a line from our day out always comes to mind which was one of my friends in college her, her line was liverpool liverpool come on say you dislocated sparrow you know because she was talking to a parrot and she was just like trying to get it to talk so um <clears throat> you know and that sort of thing and um yeah it was very fun trying to learn the liverpool accent and i knew how to do it i just about knew how to do a Welsh accent because in that play I played Les the lollipop lady I was the shopkeeper of a sweet shop in Wales and then I played um and then I played the school kid so then moving on to the level three there was a rumor that we were doing Fiddler on the Roof and thought oh brilliant we're gonna do a musical this is pretty cool you know um but unfortunately we didn't end up doing uh Fiddler on the Roof in the end we did um we did Liza Strata And in that, I was an old man in the old man chorus. I was a Spartan and an Athenian. And when we did it, we set it in World War Two, you know. And of course, a lot of the script was edited, parts of the script were edited. And then one of our tutors left at Christmas. So we had two new tutors, that sort of thing. And I will give props to this tutor because he did manage to save a sinking ship because we thought we weren't going to be able to get Lysa Strata to the point of being able to perform it but but what the hey we managed to do it you know <clears throat> you know and so luckily there were bits where he just kind of went through and just you know some people would just go through and edit the script and cut things out mm-hmm. he macheted part he absolutely macheted part of it which was pretty good to kind of do whatever so it wasn't going to be like because I think the full play itself is probably something like three hours to perform that kind of thing if you were to do every every single line every single song and whatever and things like that it would be like three hours long and you would just it would basically basically be the same length as the Avengers Endgame <laughs> but with <laughs> but with no superheroes and people with fake willies down their pants you know that kind of thing. You know? And actually, Mike was asking me the other day, like, how did you manage to do your fake willies and Liza Strata? Well, we got a, a bit of toilet roll and some cotton, or some, you know, some cotton wool and a pair of Val's old tights. Oh, but, but no, but no sticky plastic, unfortunately, people. Um, but that's how we, that's how we did it. And um, I, could, I kind of said to Mike, I can appreciate how a man has to readjust himself down there because I was trying to get it in a way that it looked like it was trying to poke out the pants instead of just flat up against my body. But that was that was an interesting one to do. And, um, and I've always said to people, like, if I can stand on stage with a fake erection in my pants, I could do anything. And then the final, because it used to be two productions, the main production and then the final major project or final major production. And that year was that um, 
we were the lot and actually we were the last level three year ones to do it because basically it used to be this thing where basically you'd have this um subject matter like you know it could be the life of an artist or it could be a story and stuff like that because i think it was um i think the sec um the people who were level three second years when we were level two they did the life of vincent van gogh um when we yeah and then i think it was when we were level two the level the level three year ones did the wizard of oz and that sort mm-hmm. of thing and then when we did it we did uh, we called it the freeze of life and we did ours on the life of Evard monk so we had you know so basically you'd be given these kind of scenes and whatever and dance routines and physical theater and things like that you know and you'd be told to devise parts of these scenes and whatever and um and then you just pretty much put it all together in one big show and i remember at one point i had quite a big bit in the play because there's a bit where i'm painting the screen and then it follows into a scene where Edvard goes into alcoholism and a mental health breakdown because there's a bit where we're drinking alcohol pretends for up and then when everybody saw me go down on my knees they had to come forward and just basically start off really quiet but then build up and build up and build up things like you're useless or you can't, you can't do anything i can't do this you know i need to get out and then just kill, constantly build and build and build and build until i'm just there screaming and originally it was supposed to be be me giving out this massive scream but then um someone said oh why don't you do it without the screen just like like that which I felt like I kind of didn't have much of an effect, but, you know, if a tutor says something, you know, you're not going to argue back. And then it led into another, a tiny, another, another tiny scene where I sort of say, I need help and stuff. And then it led into the um, ECT scene, which uh, basically means electric convulsive therapy and that kind of thing. And, uh, and yeah, one of my tutors didn't believe that um, electric, electric, convulsion therapy is still used to this day which it is but it's only used as a last minute resource if all therapies and medications have not worked and that sort of thing so so that was kind of my big chunk that I got to do in it and then we got into the level three um the level the second year of the level three which basically at that point both the year ones and year twos were put together on one course, you know, basically put together on one course because they didn't have enough level three year ones to do it separately. So we all basically, so like basically what we learnt in our second year, the first years le- learnt it in their um, first year and then the stuff that they didn't cover in their first year and what we covered in our first year, they covered in their second year and things like that. And um, we did plays like Cauca- the Caucasian Chalk Circle, and you know, once again, that had that had parts of it edited out, and I think that had like a whole scene edited out, and stuff like that. And um, I remember we did it, and you know, we we got through it and that sort of thing. And also beforehand, before we did the Caucasian Chalk Circle, we did a bit on devised plays. And we presented something to our parents at the, I think it was at the end of induction week or something like that, uh, you know. And then we then, yeah, so then we did Caucasian Short Circle and then we did another play for our final major production, which was Love and Information, which is basically a play. Sorry, I've got to mention Caucasian Short Circle is one of the famous plays written by Bertolt Brecht. And, um, and I forgot to mention in the level two that we did our, for our final major production, we did um, a play called Hard to Swallow. And we did that in a Brechtian style where basically it was about anorexia nervosa and that sort of thing based on a true story. Anyway, back to the um, back to love and information. Um, that was a play where basically there was no set parts and no set scenes. You're just given a scene with a title and some lines and you're left to devise what you think the scene is and things like that. And I did a dance because they had a list of optional scenes and one of them was dance. And I thought, oh, I'd like to do a dance because there was a little bit of choreography I've done before to a song. And so I developed it into a story because it's for a song called um, 
It's by Eskimo Disco and it's called 7-Eleven, which famously has um, the... It famously has the... Um, it, fam it famously has Pingu in it, in the music video. And there was a line in the song, or at the beginning of the song, which is, most of the world is civilised and the world never be civilised. So how I did it was that a couple of friends wanted to join in, so they, they're there, as if it was like for an interview process. So I'm turning up and I'm trying to look all nice and civilised and act civilised and when doing the dance and stuff I only like did like small movements with it with the first bit but then as I go on I get a bit more confident and then at the end I decide screw being civilised and stuff like that I am going to whip my blouse off and go to kick my shoes off take my hair down, shush it up and go for the dance and stuff and um because it was basically letting out your inner uncivilized person, hence why taking the blouse off. I wasn't just taking it off in general so people could see me boobs. And apparently, um, <laughs> a couple of people said to me afterwards, they said my parents had no idea where to put their eyes. <laughs> they weren't sure where they weren't sure where to look and that kind of thing. But you know, I did it, and um, I was like on the second floor. I was with with the guy like one of the tutors who was doing the techie with the students. I don't know if it was their fault or his fault or whatever, but like after someone had done their last movement, you know, um, you know, because basically before I came on, each of the people would do like um, a movement that was based on like um, part of the dance, which was one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. And they do little bits of that. And then there was a huge gap between the person doing that and the music not coming on and then as the music came on it was at a point where I was already sitting down and afterwards I was saying to my friend I'm having a good old rant or whatever you know well very quietly because the place was on and um but yeah it turned out really good and I remember um a couple of like my dad was like well I didn't I didn't expect that and my aunt came along and she said you're a very naughty girl but good <laughs> Good show, Steph. Good show. <laughs> sort of thing. So, you know, and then after I left college, I carried on with the performing arts with the Bocking Theatre Club and things like that. So, that is my extensive history on my um, doing theatre. I'm sure you're wishing you never asked me in the first place. <laughs> Mike, I do apologise. Oh, oh, what, 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 what? I, I I guess I forgot to take notes. Uh, anybody at home paying attention to all that? Um, we'll, we'll uh, I guess we're gonna take a quiz on this later. Okay. <laughs> I'm yours. No, I I'm love just, you. I, but... I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I I tried to follow along, but yeah. Um, I know. That's that was very extensive, and yeah, I mean, for theater people out there, that might be interesting to, to find out about you because. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are pursuing theater and, of course, yeah. music. Because uh, believe me, you've got to have the confidence to stand up in front of people and sing, you know, and that's probably where I got it from. And mm -hmm. and actually, some people have said to me, like, have you ever had stage fright weather? It's like, nah, nah, it doesn't bother me. You know, some people are like, oh, I would love to do performing and stuff, but I get stage fright. I, I don't know if I can stand out there on a stage and have people look at me. And I'm just like... I'm just there. I'm in the limelight, and then people give me compliments. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's me on the inside. On the right. outside, I'm like, oh, thank you, stuff like that. I don't want to make myself sound like a really selfishly vain right. person, but mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I, I find I, I do like it when the compliments come in. That's Boosts good. my confidence. <laughs> um, I just I'm trying to keep keep it short, if you can. Um, what is what was your favorite? play or musical you've done um oh god there's been so many i think just trying to think because there's been different ones or whatever mm -hmm. i have to say like my favorite pantomime i've done because i've done i've done four pantomimes and my most favorite one was doing snow white because um i got to play one of my dream roles which was 
to be part of the Dame Psychic and that kind of thing. So I got to do that. And um, the Dame was Dolly Dumpling and I played her son, Danny Dumpling. So that, and that was really good fun. When it comes to straight plays, I have to say like my, the one that I've enjoyed doing, even though it was a bit of a struggle to get through it, but you find that with most plays. And that was the most recent play I'd done, which is Bang Out, because I got to play a character that was totally different to characters I've played before. And it was it was pretty good fun playing someone who is just basically more than just a loose screw. That loose screw is on the floor rolling around, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that was such a fantastic role to play and that sort of thing, you know. Um <sighs> And then variety shows. I, I have to say, I really, I did enjoy the last variety show we did because I got to like, um, I got to do a song with a friend that we've done the thing before where I had the backing track and then he plays along with his piano, and the song is I saw her standing there. Uh, it's a really cool rock and roll song, but when he get, when he gets onto the piano, he gives it a real honky tonk style to it, like style to it. So, um, you know, I think. I think each production I've done has been special for each memory, but I think definitely favourite variety show, most recent one we've done back in 2017, favourite panto, Snow White, The Seven Dwarfs, and then favourite straight play we've done so far is Bang Out. There's probably others for different reasons, nice. you know. Nice. Uh-huh. Uh, is that short enough for you? <laughs> that, that's good, that's good. Uh, I mean, I mean, long elaborated answers are great, because it's great to get to know you even more, because actually... I mean, I've known you for three years, and I'm actually getting deeper with you with the knowledge you're telling me. So, just kind of. It is open. So let's uh, let's talk about how you got into the hospital radio. Um, hospital radio was um, for a bit of context, people. That's how me and Mike bonded in the first place. Um, hospital radio was actually when someone on the level three tech course technicians course um said that they did hospital radio and stuff like that uh, i think it was it was 2014 i think it was right about a time where i was just like unemployed looking for work and i was just looking for something to do and i said um how do you get into doing hospital radio like how did you apply and things like that and so he gave me the link he said i'll go to the website and put yourself down as a that you want to volunteer so i did that and i got a call from someone saying um oh i hear you want to be um you want to come volunteer for us and i said yes please and stuff like that so then i went for an, an interview with with him you know and it was two other girls um, basically, uh, it was a case of like, what can you bring to this and whatever? And he showed us how to do things and whatever and things like that. And then we got, because we put down like what days we were available and whatever. And I got put down in the Wednesday night request team. Mm-hmm. And so before, and before we were allowed to go on and do the shows and things like that, we'd be given our training. So you knew how to, you know, how to work the deck and microphone positions and things like that and also one of the reasons I did it is because I wanted to get confidence back into doing audio work and I'm sure a lot of people from hospital hospital radio who worked with me they probably would know that I did use to beat myself up a lot only because um when I did audio acting in my last year at college for the first half term my tutor basically in other words bullied me because apparently i i would be like so close to getting the highest mark which you can get in any assignment which was a distinction and i was always at merit level but the way that he used to make me feel and things like that and how he used to just like throw feedback at me in a very and basically a bullying way and it got like too much at one point where i just couldn't stay in his class and i was emotional and things like that and spoke to him and he made me feel like that in drama improvisation because I thought I wasn't good at it. But actually, when it came to audio acting, it was like, actually, the reason I think I'm bad at improvisation is because of you. And he did say to me, he's like, oh, I didn't make you feel like that in drama improvisation. And I said no, but actually, yes, you did. Um, if you're listening to this now, you did make me feel like that in drama improvisation, um, which was not nice, but 
that's in the past and everything like that. And so we got things sorted out. And because I always thought I was at a pass level, because basically there's three like sort of grades you can get for an assignment, which is pass, merit, and distinction. And I always thought I was pass or not even passing at all. But it was at merit level, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm actually doing a lot better than I thought. So to do hospital radio it was for me to get back into the confidence of doing audio work you know mm-hmm. doing a little bit of radio work and stuff like that because mm-hmm. you know and even there were times if i slightly mucked up on something or if i said something slightly wrong or slightly said the wrong thing or i made an oopsie or whatever i would just beat myself up and like oh my god i can't believe i did that i'm so sorry i'm terrible i'm useless and things like that i I wasn't really, you know, I don't think I was really that bad and that sort of thing. I mean, everybody was wonderful to me and that sort of thing and helped me. But I just felt like that because of how I was treated in audio acting. So, um, but I did, you know, I slowly, slowly over time, I did rebuild the confidence and kind of doing it and thinking, actually, in this kind of field, I can do it. I can believe in myself to do this and whatever and you know I can do it so and in the end you know not only did I get to do um you know a bit of radio work and whatever with the Wednesday night requesting but you got to go out on the wards and visit people and things like that and we met some lovely patients and um you know and through there you got to discover some really cool music and whatever and then (coughs) excuse me and then you know it I did other events as well, you know, like charity events. Like um, for two years running, I did the Great Bado Fun Run, which was often good fun to kind of, you know, go along and do that, you know, and compare that and things like that. Um, You know, we, yeah, and, um, you know, and I think we actually did one of the fun days at the hospital as well, which I think it might have been in 2016 when... Actually, it might have been 2015, because I was there from October 2014 till July of 2016, because I got the carer's job and couldn't do it anymore and things like that. Because after I was on the request team for a while, I actually then went on to have my own show on a Sunday afternoon, which was Steph's Little Den, which is actually what the series on my YouTube channel, Steph's Little Den, is actually named after, because I thought, I want to do this fun little series. What should I call it? And I thought... Actually, I would love to do something a little bit like Steph's Little Den that I did before. And actually, my and my show on the radio was, it wasn't like on, on YouTube. Basically, it was a slot that was given to me on a Sunday afternoon. And I think it was something like, I think it was something like two till four, possibly, you know. Or was it two till three? I can't remember. I can't remember if my show was like an hour or two hours long, that kind of thing. But, you know, it was one of those things. And um, I remember I would just, you know, I used to play like, you know, chill, chill back, like relaxing songs and things like that. And kind of, you know, I think I kind of always ended up playing the same songs and stuff. But I don't think anyone complained or whatever, you know that sort of thing. And um, and I did like a relaxation exercise with people during it and actually actually thinking about it I think it was two hours because I think I did like an hour of like music and then as we got to three o'clock um we did um I think we did like say five to ten minutes of that or something like that or actually it might be at quarter past three that we did it and then up till 3 30 to like go into a break and then carried on till about four o'clock um, with more more music and you know and that kind of thing and I'd like kind of talk in between songs and things like that and chat to people well not like chat to people and that sort of thing but like talk to the audience and things like that and it was really good fun and then unfortunately I found that I had to give it up because often the days that I was working as a carer at the weekends um I ended up working Sundays so every other Sunday I wouldn't have been able to do because of work you know things like that so I put in my resignation saying that unfortunately um, I'm I can no longer do the show but thanks for all the support but I'm gonna have to leave hospital radio thanks for all the support and things like that you guys have helped me and I said if you if you ever want to hear from me again 
just give a knock on the door and I'll be back for more. Because that's what that's how I used to end my show. Was why if you want to join me again next week, just give me a knock on the door and I'll be back for more. And that's how I did it. And so that's basically my hospital radio story. And I did meet some fantastic friends, and we, you know, we got to go for like a Christmas. Uh, a Christmas meal somewhere and things like that and you know I got to meet some of the other people at Hospital Radio that you don't usually get to see which was fantastic so yeah yeah it's uh, with my experience with radio I went to uh, for context uh, my first year at the university I I think the only reason why I went to the university is to get on college radio and I have did my shift, which was like a morning shift, and I played usually the same songs, like, because I, I like, picked the ones I wanted to play on the air, but I was sneaking, like, a few different ones in between, but I was like, yeah, hey, I'm going to play this song and this song, and, of course, I would, like, talk in between, of course, like, I had to do, like, announcements, like, for the college, and then, like, you know, stuff in between, and promote stuff, and play, like, clips for, like, play, like, sound clips for a show or like play commercials and it was kind of a cool experience doing that i mean this is like after i went to radio broadcasting school so i kind of like it was like oh cool i'm actually at a real station sort of just playing whatever and just being myself on the air so so i, I kind of felt what you were feeling at the time so um that's why we kind of hit it off so quickly when we first started the chat it was like oh yeah we we're both on radio and that was pretty cool and mm. yeah that sort of thing <clears throat> so let me turn because this is around the same time you actually started your youtube channel yes actually i started my youtube channel the year before in 2013 yep. but yeah because it was right about yeah because it was actually yes it was my before. think i it was yeah before. it was just before I turned 20 so yeah. I was it was in the summer holidays between me finishing the first year of the level three and starting the second year of the level three and originally my YouTube channel was going to be used to put acting showcase videos up for acting jobs and things like that but then so many so many YouTube type videos later it just turned into your normal YouTube channel and things like that and you can definitely tell like the early days of YouTube some people might think like oh you haven't really come far in a YouTube channel well this is you're talking to the girl who basically used to do things very much like early day YouTube style which was basically laptop go onto YouTube say want to record a video it would let you access your camera and you just record a video on there and then you just upload it and things like that i had no clue about editing or anything like that and then it was it wasn't until we did the we did our college films that we learned how to edit and and that sort of thing and i learned how to edit on imovie but luckily um with some of those skills i was able to pass over into doing you know editing for youtube channels and things like that and mm -hmm. i got given a, a a camcorder for my 21st birthday well actually i said i wanted one so my parents gave it you know my parents went out and bought me one and that kind of thing i still have it somewhere it's just i've lost the i've lost the charge pack for it or the, the charging cable or something like that you know but um but basically i did that and i started you know, I started to make my videos look a bit more professional and things like that. And then mm -hmm. along the way, I kind of learned how to kind of, um, how to kind of use things and edit things and whatever, you know. And it's a shame that we don't have Windows Movie Maker anymore. I think it's Windows Media Maker, but, you know, it's probably that little bit different or whatever. So, but nowadays I use Filmora editing software and so basically my youtube channel basically turned into a youtube channel in, in general and i have to say selfishing selfishly i did try and do it to get the views and stuff because i was i just see i just heard stories about how people become have become viral and things like that and i thought i want that too but you can't do that and it was actually through mike that actually um 
gave me the confidence to do YouTube as a hobby because I there were times where I thought like, oh, you know, I'm not getting views in this video. Do I bother making another video? But I enjoy doing it anyway, but I'm probably not going to get the views and whatever, damn. But for Mike, it was like, he said, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't get views and stuff. You know, you can just go for it anyway, just do it as a hobby. And so I thought, yeah, why not? And um, I mean, there are a couple of videos on my YouTube channel. One of them's private, one of them isn't. But two of those videos have gotten like over a thousand views or one of them, the private the video I've made private has actually made it to like 2,000 views, like over 2,000 views, something like that. So yeah, so um, so basically what I was trying to do, like my YouTube channel has been like, the theme of it all has just been all over the place because I tried, I think it was just kind of me trying out different things and whatever and what I kind of wanted to try out. So like when I first started out, I did my own review series, mm -hmm. stuff like that. I did a review series, I yep. did the Bean Boozled Challenge, I did this video, I did that video, whatever, you know, just fun little videos or whatever, but there wasn't really any sort of focus. And right. then, a I think maybe like a year or so ago, I thought maybe I need to get some more focus and whatever in. So, basically, my video, my channel at the moment is either Vlog With Me, Steph's Little Den, or sing showcase video, that kind of thing. Or if there's any other miscellaneous video that pops up, that's just a miscellaneous video, you know, that sort of thing. So that's kind of basically my YouTube journey and things like that. And there's only one video that I've done with another person in collaboration. It's the same gentleman right here on my left. And that was back when we did the, um, my boyfriend does my voiceover. And um, some people may have thought that, like, oh, when I broke up with Mike, I would have deleted that video. But actually, I didn't because it was a fun video. Um, you know, both me and Mike did a great job in that. And actually, I wanted to keep it there. So it's like it kind of, like, shows that chapter of our lives because I just wanted mm -hmm. to be there to sort of say, like, you know, that was a, a chapter of our life, lives, lives basically and um you know i just want people to be able to relive that chapter with me and things like that and um you know and of course i did do one series which was drunk stuff reacts but after a while after i'd done i'd done two videos and i tried to do a third video several times but just that car was starting to take its toll on me so i have filmed a video but whether i will edit it in some way or whatever it depends but I'm hoping to do another reaction series, but being a kind of more sober reaction series, that kind of thing. So, you know, but, um, you know, and things like that. And I was still doing YouTube when uh, I found out that I was going to be on Cinema Royale or when I was chatting with Mike and talking about being on Cinema Royale and things like mm -hmm. that. And so, you know, I still did like my youtube channel whilst doing cinema royale and stuff like that and i still do to this day whilst you know whilst i'm doing um between the ponds you know i'm still doing like i'm still doing youtube alongside it so it's kind of like you know that's my youtube story <laughs> you know so that's how i got started on youtube and then a year later i was on i i then joined hospital radio chanceford so I was I was just barely a teenager when I joined YouTube because it was about it might be about two or three days before my um before my twentieth birthday. July fifteenth, two thousand thirteen. Yeah, two days before my birthday, and that was actually my due date. But I was two days late, so yeah. Yeah. Um... I'm actually going through your YouTube channel right now, just scrolling through. Um, there, there is a pattern, you, as from the early days, like, you see the reviews, of course. Um, she did she did play reviews. Um, oh, yeah, because the Nostalgia Review, uh, that series is privated, but I think the other ones I did um, are still there. Yeah, because I did yep. a Play Review series, yep. mm -hmm. and it was basically on plays that I had done, you yeah. know, because mm -hmm. it'd be very impossible to do a play review on a play you haven't done. <laughs> right. Um, 
And of course, like she said, she has gone through uh, that typical classic YouTuber phase where they've done all the tag videos and you know, yeah. and then do those. And there's a lot of those in their early. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention I, I did those tag videos. <laughs> Yep. Because um, there used to be websites where you could just find all these tag videos, yeah. and so I thought I'd do them, and including the 15 weird questions tag. That yep. was actually one that I saw um, Kane and Lucy do, and so I did it. Yep. Um, there's some other, like, <laughs> random videos and vlogs. She's, uh, she's definitely a vlogger, for sure. Um, but yeah, recently she's been getting into singing showcases and recently she just uploaded a couple new songs she's producing for a upcoming album actually those ones were ones that i'd done in my singing lessons um whether i would okay so technically technically we reveal what the secret project is so if anyone that's following me um my secret project is that I am doing an album, um, not one to be sold in shops and things like that. I'm not that famous yet. Right, right. <laughs> so, right. Calm down, people. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've produced a CD for um, for when I do gigs, and I can go and sell it and things like that. I'm just waiting to publish it and stuff like that. Right. So I'm thinking I might have to do the publishing process myself and that kind of thing, but I'm sure it's going to be a simple thing. I can just create some designs to put on the front cover, back cover, that kind of thing, yep. and then just burn them on to a bunch of CDs, things like that, you know. Probably saves money going to a, a graphics designer and going to a publishing company right. and things like that, you know. Do things on the cheap and whatever. So so if anyone who um <laughs> anyone who's been following the secret project for nearly like for like a year or so that is the secret project i am doing a cd so yeah so whether i'll upload the album to youtube it really depends because we know how eggshell like youtube's copyright system is right right but, um, I, but I haven't had i haven't had anything pop up on the two videos i've, I've put on youtube yet facebook partially muted still hurting thanks facebook because you always thought that Facebook was the safest place to go. But no, you can get copyrighted on Facebook. I've had that done twice to me. And they said, like, if this happens again, you may lose your account. Shit. <laughs> uh, not like sh shit as in shit, but as in shit. Shit. <laughs> you know, kind of <laughs> bad or whatever. Um. So, um, so, yeah. But apart from that, luckily YouTube, Touchwood, has not copyrighted me yet. <laughs> Because, you know, I don't know how to fight that sort of thing. I'm a wimp, you know? But yeah, I uh, just recommend you check it out on her channel and uh, give those a listen. And uh, as, since we're on the, still on the topic of YouTube, what is your favorite video on your channel that you enjoyed <sighs> making? I thought about this this morning when I watched the other video. And, like, what are the ones I'm kind of proud of doing? And, like, yes, it got flagged by copyright but luckily it was one of those where I've had it a couple of times where they say don't worry you don't need to do anything but there will be ads on this video well up yours YouTube I don't make money from this so jokes on you um, my PC uh, uh, my PCOS awareness video I was quite proud of doing that you know and that mm -hmm. sort of thing but, and actually when I did film it I filmed it a couple of times just to kind of get it right and also to correct some information but I was a little bit emotional when filming that because I mean the the take you see is the <coughs> final take and I wasn't emotional during that but mm -hmm. you could probably tell from my face it's a little bit red and stuff because of the emotions or whatever but I think it was because talking about my story and like I had never really had kind of spoken to someone about how it made me feel to have the condition and how it affected me like when I was younger and things like that it right. kind of got emotional especially having to confess things about like the fact that I felt ugly at age 13 and that and like when you think about it that's that's quite a, a harrowing heartbreaking thing to hear that a 13 year old finds themselves ugly finds themselves ugly you know that sort of thing 
And um, I'm trying to think what other videos I'm proud of. Like, uh, like there's a couple of like, like one of my favourite vlog with me that I do watch every now and again if I can is um, is the Braintree Carnival one of 2017, and also like the end of the Halloween one that I did with Auntie Joy tipping the sweets all over me. That was pretty oh, yeah. cool. But actually, one of the other ones that I do watch uh, but i only watched it for the end when like you guys come in like you james morgan come in um and that's the one where it was wide awake feeding the cat and drunk royale you uh, know but i usually skip to the bit where i'm talking to you guys and things like that and um <laughs> you know that funny bit like oh don't make me orgasm again <laughs> you know um so <clears throat> i think there's quite a few videos but actually i have to say i got feedback off someone for my autism my autism story yeah. that um someone at the theater group turns out they're on the spectrum as well and um they said by watching my video they actually had a lot more confidence in themselves and actually felt more comfortable in themselves because it was great to find someone else in the club that had you know who was on the spectrum and you know they gave me a massive cuddle and I was like oh thank you and I thought actually I'm really glad I put that video out because you know the fact that I was actually able to help someone was fantastic you know and um you know I think for me there's like certain videos that are you know I enjoy watching because it brings back good memories but also knowing that I'm proud of how you know, I was able to make this video and especially when you have to sit down in front of the camera and talk about some really difficult problems and stuff. And then there's mm -hmm. some videos I watch and just feel massively depressed over. Right, right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? That you like. yep. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. But yep. I, I think, you know, I think each video I've done is special in their own way. Okay. Um, I'm not going to dive too deep into this, but yeah, we've... Because we're running out of time. <laughs> we've got another podcast. <laughs> Shh, it's a secret. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, no, I'm, I'm trying to... I'm, we're getting close. We're getting close. I'm, I am getting... We're going through that timeline. Um... It's the Pierre de Resistance. Drum roll, people. <laughs> we, uh... We met... And I started to put her in... Long story short, we talked because I was doing a special for Summer Royale in April, and I was planning it in January, just planning ahead. She auditioned, she was interested, amongst other people. We talked, and I was interested in her because she was, like, you know, interesting, and I just talked to her more. The only Brit and the only girl who auditioned. Yeah. Um, what the hell was I thinking? We, uh... <laughs> Eventually became friends on Facebook, and down the road I still kept talking to her, talking to her, and then eventually, oddly enough, she got onto the main show, which was Cinema Royale. Um, I was yeah. getting to the, I was making that timeline jump, kind of because we're in the same timeline here. But what was the favorite episode you appeared on for Cinema Royale? Just the, not, not like going too deep into it, but just like. Oh, that is a tough one. <laughs> That's a real toughie. Oh my god! Like all the ones I've been on, like there's there's moment. I think for me, it's more moments, moments. That I've enjoyed. Like um, the weird the poo episode. I loved when I'm trying to talk about the Shirley Temple um, show with Weird the Poo, and she's talking about pooing, and I'm talking about pooing in the weird the poo sense. And then uh, there's Matt, who's Matt with his toilet humor. Uh, <laughs> bursting out laughing and then um i mean the ones that i wasn't so much a fan of were the ones where i fell asleep but... right but that's just what happened with scheduling and shit like that so yeah. it wasn't that's... like good i know yeah. we understood that but i mean yeah. with those two i mean with those two episodes there was still some kind of right fun was... moments that happened mm -hmm. or like at the end like it's okay just compose yourself now remember the subjects and stuff now remember, the, now remember the topic is Dom to Louise. It's like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I, I'm tired, but I'm not stupid. 
Yeah. But I liked um, the Hanna Barbera one. There were some fun moments in there, oh. like, like especially with Michael Kempton, like the. Um, I understand, I understand the Marmite thing, but you've gone way too far. Because I, what I said about that, I said about like him liking Marmite. But I completely forgotten that that man likes to eat Marmite and jam. And then he <laughs> said, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with Marmite and jam. I'm like... Because <laughs> 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 oh, that was after talking about um, putting vinegar and chips and things like that. Because right. I said, vinegar shouldn't be put on films or even chips. He's like, I like vinegar. Nothing wrong with vinegar. And I'm like, wait, do you put vinegar on your chips, Michael? Of course. That's what it's for. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. It was just funny. And I mean, oh, actually, another moment I love from the Hannah Barbera episode is when we're talking about Yogi Bear. And I said, you were talking about Yogi Bear. And all I got going from my head is, give me that fire, you mama ran. Hey, boo boo. And you like Ranger Smith. Medium rare, Yogi. That's gone. And then it was. Just a couple of seconds later, Matt was sat there like, oh. It was like, yeah, Penny's finally dropped. <laughs> it's like, I'm quoting one of your videos, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, I think in a way, all the episodes that I've been on, like, there's been fun moments from each of them. And especially doing the ones where basically I was able to actually get a word in their choice. <laughs> and uh, I sound like an utter bitch when I say that, but it's true. But I love the moments where, you know, I got to be funny and things like that. Like talking about uh, Little John giving himself a boob job with coins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all around the bottom of it. Yeah. Like, oh, thanks, bring all the boys to the So... So to kind of sum it all up, to, to basically sum up my ramblings, is that um, basically, like, each episode that I've been in, they're all special in their own way. Okay. Like, they all have special moments. And, of course, we uh, made vid videos individually as well, and yeah. we just, uh, yeah, we've... Yeah, we did the, um, the boy boyfriend slash girlfriend tag, and that video was like... Like, how long? About nine years long? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It's breaking, breaking records with the longest of everything. Because we talk yeah. a lot. And this will be another example of the longest as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think this has gone on for about mm, ten years, <laughs> nine weeks, <laughs> 15 days, ten minutes, and... Wait, sorry, 10 hours, 5 minutes and 15 seconds. I'm counting. <laughs> so, that, I, I, that probably made no mathematical <laughs> sense whatsoever, but... I will... Sorry. I will... We're up to the current uh, leg of your life now, where you recently... I thought, you were, I thought you were going to say the current leg of this interview, and you were going to tell me, like, how far we were into the yeah. interview. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to... I'm not going to wreck this recording because I'm not going to pull that program. I was going to do that thing. No, and just, and also, so, you're, also, you're so. too polite to do that. So I'm not going to like do that. Um, I'll wait till I officially stop recording. Uh, no, the last thing I wanted to talk about with you was the, the thing you're doing now with everything is you recently became a freelance singer and you're singing Yes. So how was that experience, and what do you look to the future with your career as a singer? Um, yeah, two years ago, I started, I left my job as a carer and became a freelance singer. I can't believe it's two years ago. It still only feels like yesterday. Still really only feels like yesterday. But yeah, two years ago, and... Um, it's kind of really hard to kind of pinpoint how I how I got to that conclusion and that sort of thing and planned it out. Right. But I think one of the things that happened was when I was younger was that I met a guy called Martin Weavers who was a freelance entertainer, singer, um, who did a men cut party. And I thought, wow, adults can do this, but without needing to be a famous singer, you can just go out there and entertain people. I wouldn't mind having a go at this when I'm older. And then years later, like it was roughly 2015 that I think, you know, I kind of done a little bit of singing in certain shows and whatever. And 
enjoyed doing it because I don't like in between variety shows or whatever like we've done little shows here and there and um, I think it was when we did the one at Gospel sorry Gosfield Church and then my friend John Elson who's an entertainer he said oh you know why don't you come along to one of my gigs and do a song so I got to do that and that was brilliant and then 2016 he had another gig and I got to do a couple more songs you know more than one and you know I just really enjoyed doing that you know and I think what kind of like really sort of pinpointed for me to sing in care homes was that I remember being at Larchwood one day where I, where I worked and I was doing some training and I, I finished and I was having a little break and they had an entertainer in the Rhone lounge and it was uh, my friend Susie M and I met her there and um, she said about she was going to do the Lambeth Walk and she said oh does anybody know how to do the Lambeth Walk which is literally oh, you can't see on the laptop which is da 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 oi you know because it's literally da 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 boom oi like that and she said oh really you can do that and so she got me up to do it and stuff and she said oh how did you learn how did you learn about the Lambeth Walk and I said oh I'm part of this theatre group and also with the theatre group I've done this thing where we go to like a couple of us selected ones we go to places and we do cockney songs and wartime songs and things like that and we've done the lamp of before and she said oh do you sing and I said yeah and she said what songs do you sing I said like Connie France oh I said like Mama Cass um dare I say uh Connie Francis because I was learning all these songs and whatever for like um well, especially like Connie Francis and Mama Cass, that kind of thing, for like just to build up my repertoire for shows and whatever. And she said, Oh, I've got a Connie Francis song. And she said, What about Do Stupid Cube? And I said, Okay, I'll give it a go. And it was in a different key, which was kind of hard to kind of wrap my head around. But after a while, I did. And then loads of people sort of saying to me, like, Wow, that was really good and everything. So, wow, that was brilliant. I didn't know you had such a good voice. And just having that moment to sort of perform for them and things like that I just found like they all really enjoyed it and you know and it's kind of a bit of a blur that memory but I thought I would love to come back here and sing you know and then other things happened that made me leave Larchwood but one other thing was that I thought actually I would love to kind of become a freelance singer and start my own business and things like Mm -hmm. that and um and being able and actually having watched other performers in the care home it's the one thing i find amazing about music is that it's such a powerful tool like especially for people with dementia like especially for some of them there who may not even remember what they did last week let alone what they had for breakfast that morning or they may not recognize family relatives or things like that and yet and yet when you sing these songs you see them they know all the lyrics to practically every song you're doing that kind of thing be it you know be it Elvis Presley, um, Doris Day, Mama Cass, uh, Connie Francis or even Beatles or things like that Cockney songs they know all the lyrics and they're there and they're singing away clapping away you know clapping or some of them get up and dance and do things like that and whatever it depends what care home you go to some people get up and dance some people just sit there clap along and sing along and stuff like that and then some give you the silent appreciation which makes you never say yes throughout your whole gig but it was just the fact that you see them and they just come to life and they light up you know and they're smiling and they're happy and the fact that you're able to give someone an hour of joy and happiness um just through music and the fact that you're also giving them something that they remember because they may not remember what they've had for breakfast or who their relatives are and stuff like that but the fact that you are connecting them back to something they remember probably one of the very few things that they remember you know and you're taking them back to their youth and things like that and you know because we are very nostalgic creatures us humans you know and if you can give them that nostalgia vibe and you take them back to a time when they were younger or maybe 
uh, you may sing a song that they remember listening to when they first got married or things like that and you give them that memory or you end up making them cry so it's not just you Mike I did Elvis Presley's Can't Help Falling in Love With You and made someone cry and I was like oh I'm so sorry <laughs> but you know but I think it's I think it's because they kind of were linked to that memory you know that kind right. of thing but it's it is just wonderful when you're able to do that and you know especially if you can be able to give people fun like everybody loves a good party everybody loves a good boogie on the dance floor and people love belting the lungs out to certain songs and things like that you know it's it's just wonderful that i can give people that fun and enjoyment and especially when you know they say that life's too short it's so true so while you can just do what you love and if it's listening to music and things like that and singing and dancing and if you've got someone there to help provide music for you to sing and dance along to then so be it and that's what makes the job so rewarding for me and actually I'm really glad that I do do the care homes and social groups for adults with learning disabilities and things like that um you know the fact that it gives it that rewarding aspect and kind of helps you stay grounded because and actually one moment I remember was <clears throat> I think it might have been September of um, 2017 it's been a little while since I've had some pay gigs or gigs in general that kind of thing and I thought why am I doing this I have bills I need to pay and whatever but I'm still scared to go get a job and things like that what am I doing you know I, I'm, I'm not getting any pay gigs you know pay gigs coming in and stuff I need to pay bills but then I did the Denji Club in Whitton and basically the Denji Club is like gateway of um, it's run by Branch Man Cap it's like gateway but it's basically the Wednesday night club instead of the Thursday night club and it's in a smaller hall in Whitton called the Denji Hall and so I did that and and the one thing I always do when I go there is there's always one song that I sing, which I've nicknamed the Denji Club National Anthem, um, which is a song that I, I, you know, I've listened to and I've been learning it and whatever. I really enjoy doing and things like that. It's a fun song. So I thought, I'll just do the song, see how, see how they will, you know, receive it and see what the reception is on it. And they fell in love with it. And that is the Ray Charles song hit the road jack for some reason it just went down a storm with them and they just loved it and i've had people message me saying like oh i was great to see you tonight steph you did really or like great great gig tonight steph hit the road jack and then she's going back no more i'm like (laughs) brilliant and so every time i do it you know you know i do it and they just love it they sing along and everything like that and actually doing that gig helped me kind of like you know helped me to kind of rediscover why I was doing it and the fact that they said that someone there who usually only just does the raffle and doesn't do anything else they were up and they danced a little bit sung a little bit and they were up and talking to people which was something that they very rarely did actually that they told me they very rarely would go up and interact with other people and yet whilst I was there they went up and interacted and said to to Mandy Irons oh thanks for booking Steph she's brilliant you know and even today when I did a gig someone said that you know usually they're not you know singing along or clapping along I think usually it's like oh you don't usually see that person sing along to songs and whatever and yet with me there they sung along and they found that really wonderful so the fact that in this job I'm able to help people kind of maybe come out their shell in some weird way like don't ask me how I do it because I don't even know if I knew basically Mike if I knew how I did it I would put it in a bottle and sell it you know or keep it to myself you know just have a spare bottle just in case I need that magic you know all of a sudden um but that's just kind of what makes the job so rewarding and it's kind of hard to kind of describe it because I've done it for two years it's something I do but I just love doing it and um, the fact that I can provide people joy and happiness through music um, for an hour or so it's brilliant because when I first started my business my life goal was to basically provide joy and happiness through music for people 
and I feel like I I'm achieving that most of the time. Uh, future, pl- sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I was just gonna. Yeah. Uh, so, are you like, did you continue with it as a future job and career, or are you gonna strive I... off it eventually? I mean, at the moment, I would love to be able to carry on doing it and that kind of thing. Hopefully, you know, in the future, I would love to be able to get to a point where I could have, say, three gigs a week and that kind of thing, you know, to maybe bring in the money and stuff. But sometimes I try not to think about the money. I try not to do that because if I think, I feel like if I think about the money side of it too much, I lose that rewarding aspect of it. You know, because some because people can, you can get so wrapped up in thinking, I need a paid gig. No, I can't do this free. You've got to pay me. I have bills I need to pay and things like that. Oh my god, you know, I've got bills need paying. You know, please, please, please book me. I need the money. You lose. You lose sight of why you did it, why you done the job in the first place. So, I mean, I thought about it the other day, and like I've had part-time jobs before, you know. And I mean, if this ends up only being part-time for me and not full-time, then so be it. I mean, at the moment, I find by doing this job, one of the reasons I found this was better to do because, in some ways, I'm being paid more money to do something in the less least amount of time like so say for instance like i'd probably be paid like i would probably make at most 40 quid in a week's work as a carer things like that i can make say 65 pounds in an hour that sort of thing you know it's just that the one thing that one of my friends taught me freelance singer taught me my friend sj taught me is that gigs do come in three month weight three months waves or like you know or basically there are times of the year where you will be more busier than others like some times of the year you are going to be chock-a-block with stuff and things like that you know well you know you're gonna have well you know 70 months where you are just so busy or you'll have some months where you're hardly busy at all like you haven't got much to do you know so that's kind of what I've taken on and I would love to be able to carry on doing this um in the future and things like that if if everything goes well and things like that if i had to get a job alongside then so be it just to help kind of help me financially but i've i've said to people like i've tried so many different jobs in my life this is the best thing i've ever done this is the best job i've ever had and there are times where i do wish i'd like done this earlier in my life like sometimes I kind of wish I might have done this even when I left college just to you know kind of start my own business and think actually I could do this you know I can go entertain other I could go and entertain people and go entertain the care homes and things like that and you know <clears throat> you know things like that um you know sometimes I do wish I'd done it earlier but actually I think in a way I needed the sort of life path that's led up or the timeline that's led up to me doing this now for me to kind of discover that I was good at this and that sort of thing so I think definitely I would love to be able to carry on doing this in the future and I would love to be able to do different events like I would love to do more pubs and bars and private functions and things like that which hopefully this year touch wood may happen things like that like to do weddings and parties and whatever and I would love to do pride i would love to do essex pride like i've applied i applied last year to perform at pride but nothing happened but hey what can you do maybe i could try again in the future but i would love to do essex pride you know and perform there excuse me so definitely to kind of sum up my ramblings once again i would definitely love to carry on doing this in the future and just you know try and build up the repertoire and you know make more you know get more CDs done in the future and help and do more singing lessons to help improve my voice and things like that further and you know and 
I hope to carry on, you know, I just hope to carry on making people happy and spreading joy and happiness in this world because, you know, there is so much doom and gloom out there. At least with me doing what I do, I'm able to, I'm able to spread that happiness because I'm sure, because I know that God wouldn't want us to be miserable all the time as they say make a joyous noise and if i can do that and i can make the world if i can just in my small humble little way make the world a better place then i will do that you know thank you (laughs) uh yeah that is it, and I actually I think our session's up now and uh, <laughs> um, thank you Dr. Mixtape same time next week <laughs> yep don't forget me don't forget to pay me <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I think that should be a good wrap up because that's lead, leads up to the future hang on I thought you were on the NHS <laughs> <laughs> well my you with the way the NHS is going <laughs> but <laughs> sorry um, as you were saying <laughs> so yeah that's this has been Mixtape Tonight. Uh, this is Steph Felton. Please check out your YouTube channel. I will link it in the description below. I will also link you Between the Pond as well because we're working on this on my channel here. You can check that out. We're going to do a new episode here pretty soon. Don't you worry. I know it's been several months, but we are working at it. We have busy lives. <laughs> as, as also, um, I'm also, I'm sure if I give the link to Mike, please come check out my Facebook singing page because there are a lot more uh, covers and things like that that I wouldn't be able to put on YouTube. So right. if you want to go and check out what else I've done and things like that, Go check out me, uh, not me YouTube, go check out me Facebooks. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely link the socials as well because you got to follow her to keep updating and interact with her as well because she is a very heartwarming gal and you definitely uh, need somebody to talk to. Check her out. I mean, it's someone worthwhile. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, she does do Q&A, so if you have any more questions that you want answered for her to answer you can actually just leave them in the comments below here and i'll send them along to her for actual future q a video so uh, as a possibility thank you, Mikey. um thank but yeah you, you're welcome uh thanks for listening thanks for watching and uh, i'll see you guys on another night with a new person talking about life and all that jazz good night stay dramatic god bless